This family has no outsiders. Everyone is an insider. All are to be held in the incredible embrace of the love that won't let us go. Amen. We gather this first Sunday of the new year here at All Saints Church in Pasadena in the shadow of the loss of a global giant of love, justice, and compassion as we continue to mourn the death of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Ninety years old and in frail health, the fact that his passing to the other realm was not unexpected does not lessen its impact, for it feels almost impossible to imagine a world without the North Star of his courage, his wisdom, and his impish humor shining in our world. Nevertheless, we persist. We grieve his loss and we celebrate his life, and we remember his indomitable spirit and faithfulness to the good news of the one who loved us enough to become one of us in order to show us how to love one another. For if Archbishop Tutu's life was about any one thing, it was about the power of that love to transform absolutely anything and absolutely anyone. In 1994, Archbishop Tutu spoke to our Episcopal Church's general convention in Indianapolis. We gathered in a cavernous convention hall with probably 3,000 people, and from the back bench bleachers where my seminarian self was sitting, he was a tiny speck of a man who filled up the whole room. I remember leaving the hall feeling like I was the luckiest person on the planet to have actually been in the same room with such holy wisdom and courageous energy. Over the years, I was blessed with several other opportunities to be in the presence of the arch, as he liked to be called. In 2005, he returned here to All Saints Church for a visit. We were, at that point, in the midst of the worst of the Anglican inclusion wars, with the Episcopal Church on the verge of being voted off the Anglican island for allowing the election and consecration of Gene Robinson as the Episcopal Bishop of New Hampshire. It was in that context of controversy, challenge, and division that Archbishop Tutu preached the sermon from which this morning's reading was excerpted. A sermon that was quintessential Tutu with its message of love, inclusion, and challenge, challenge for us to become the change we want to see in the world. The moment that remains etched in my memory forever was when he stretched out his arms wide from this very pulpit and proclaimed, it is radical. All are to be held in this incredible embrace. Gay, lesbian, so-called straight. It really was radical. So radical, it elicited a literal wave of a gasp that rippled through the filled to the rafters church. A moment I described to a reporter earlier this week as a gasp of amazement and relief and delight. For when you're struggling on the margins and the powers seem to be galvanizing against you, and you realize you have Desmond Tutu on your side, Suddenly, almost anything seems possible. Now, much has changed in the years since that 2005 visit. There are now five gay or lesbian bishops in the Episcopal Church. The threats to vote us off the Anglican island have died down to a low rumble on occasion. And as we head to our upcoming general convention this summer, 
Marriage equality is now part of our national church canons, and there is an official LGBTQ caucus, things we couldn't have even imagined 16 years ago when the arch stood in this pulpit and preached that sermon. But much has stayed the same. Division and polarization are, if anything, more entrenched than ever. Today, as we once again gather virtually rather than in person, because of the COVID surge, we cannot ignore that we also gather in the shadow of a pandemic that holds us and those we love in kind of an ongoing limbo of vulnerability. And we recognize that too many beloved members of our families and communities are now absent from us because of it. We cannot hide from the fact that our nation is increasingly polarized, our democracy is inarguably under threat, and that liberty for justice for all remains a pledge we make rather than a reality we live. There are still miles to go before we rest in the work of dismantling the systemic marginalization of LGBTQ people in our church, our nation, and our world. And we cannot deny that over it all looms the existential challenge of the climate crisis that threatens this fragile earth our island home. Nevertheless, we persist. And this morning, on the second Sunday of Christmas, on the second day of the year of our Lord, 2022, that's a lot of twos, isn't it? As we look ahead to a year that promises to be full of both challenge and change, I can think of no better way to frame the work ahead of us than with these timeless words from Howard Thurman. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, and the shepherds are back with their flocks, then the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoners, to rebuild the nations, to make peace among the people, and to make music in the heart. The work of Christmas is the work to which we are called 24-7 as we live out our call to be beacons of God's love, justice, and compassion in our beautiful and broken world. And in the year ahead, we will have our hands full, finding, healing, feeding, releasing, rebuilding, bringing, and making, reclaiming the planet an inch at a time until we truly become the kingdom come on earth we pray for every time we gather, until the human race becomes the human family Desmond Tutu called us to be, a family that has no outsiders, where everyone is an insider, and all are held in the incredible embrace of the love that won't let us go. And I'm convinced on this second Sunday of Christmas, on the second day of 2022, that how we do that work is as important as that we do that work. Now, of all the memes I scrolled past on Instagram in the last few days while I was procrastinating, whatever it was I was procrastinating by scrolling through memes on Instagram, the one that stuck with me was this. The most important lesson I've learned over this past year is don't let anyone make you cruel. No matter how badly you want to give the world a taste of its own bitter medicine, it's never worth losing yourself. Because what we face in this moment is a twofold challenge of resisting evil while not becoming the evil we deplore. Challenging those who perpetuate systemic injustice and oppression without dehumanizing them. 
resisting those who feed, water, and fertilize the polarization that plagues us without retreating to our own bubbles and silos. Rebutting those who ignore the very science that could help us end this pandemic and reverse the clock on the ticking time bomb of climate change, while remembering that whether we like it or not, we're all part of the same big, fat human family. In the words of one of the tutu quotes making the rounds this week, if you want peace, don't talk to your friends. Talk to your enemies. Now that's a tall order, but we stand on tall shoulders as we continue to learn from the work and witness of those who have gone before us in the struggle. Sunday after Sunday, we gather to hear their stories, whether here in person or online. The stories preserved for us in our scriptural family album and the ones we tell and retell in sermons and forums, on the long and on Facebook comments. Well, here's another one. This one from the sermon preached yesterday at Archbishop Tutu's funeral in Cape Town by Bishop Michael Natal, a sermon framed on the great call of Micah 6.8, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly. The bishop said, love kindness. This was our arch at his very best. He was not a harsh ideological, his was not a harsh ideological quest for justice. Always it was grounded in mercy, in hesed, to use the Hebrew word, in an enduring, loving kindness. The gentle touch, the loving heart, the forgiving heart, the warm smile, ah yes, that warm smile. Remember his fine book on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was entitled, No Future Without Forgiveness. How could someone who suffered so much hostility and disdain from his own country settle for such a conviction, such magnanimity? Because it was because all that he stood for and strove for was undergirded by a spirit of mercy towards everyone. Absolutely everyone. Because it's radical. All are to be held in this incredible embrace of the love that won't let us go. This is the love Desmond Tutu preached about the love he not only proclaimed but embodied, the fierce, powerful, both-and love of faith and action, love the late bell hooks taught us, is an act of will, namely both an intention and an action, the radical love that not only can but will find the lost, heal the broken, feed the hungry, release the prisoner, rebuild the nations, bring peace among the people, and make music in the heart. Because no matter what powers seem to be galvanizing against that love, when we remember we have both God and Desmond Tutu on our side, suddenly, absolutely anything seems possible. Happy New Year. Amen.